All right, everyone. Welcome to episode nine of the Backyard Banter podcast. My name is Matt Harmon. Um, you know me from NFL.com, uh, the creator of Reception Perception. But uh, if you've been following along with the podcast, you know that we're not really um, talking about any of that sort of stuff here. And if you're a new listener, the goal of this podcast is to kind of answer the question that we get all the time in the in the football writing industry. Like, how did you get your job? How did you get to where you are? And um, I'm really excited to bring on today's guest, uh, I mean, we have we've had a lot of really interesting people so far, but we have not had anybody that's you know been on television before, to my knowledge. So uh, today we're welcoming in ESPN's lead fantasy analyst, New York Times bestselling author Matthew Barry. Matthew, how are you doing today? I'm good, Matt. How are you? I, I'm splendid. Um, I'm really excited about this. I'm glad you agreed to do the podcast, and it, you know, kind of came about organically. Just. Uh, Somebody pointed it out, pointed us out to each other on Twitter. I mean, obviously, you know, we're familiar with each other, but so. Right. Someone had asked me about doing a, <clears throat> Field Yates and I have been doing this sort of, we've been doing a couple of different, you know, I do a podcast, obviously, that's a fantasy focus. It's called Fantasy Focus, but we do a podcast. And we've been trying to do a couple of things in the off season that are just sort of goofy and off the beaten path, one of which we did a whole thing about making a murderer. And, oh, uh, God. So <laughs> uh, what? I was oh god I've uh, that that series so many yeah, thoughts. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so we did a whole thing about making murder, and so somebody else suggested, hey, could you do one, meaning Field and I, could you do one about how to break into the business and sort of career advice, which is something that I like to talk about a lot. It's something that I'm passionate about. Um, I'm a uh, I'm a member. I'm on the I'm on the board of directors of the Fantasy Sports Writers Association, and that's an important thing for me just because that's an organization that helps a lot of young writers and promotes you know, fantasy uh, journalism and the craft of writing and, and discussing fantasy and doing analysis. So then somebody then seeing me tweet that said, hey, Matt Harmon, that sounds like your podcast, which I hadn't mm -hmm. I had not heard about. And you said, yeah, that's what we're doing here. And so. Um, so, yeah, so happy to talk to you. I appreciate the invitation. And um, and yes, at some point, I'll probably do one of these with Field Yates as well. <laughs> well, absolutely. I, I think that you. Uh you know, you there at the four letter network might get a little more traction uh, than I'm doing with my just little humble thing. I'm, I'm, I've got going on on the side over here. <laughs> um, it's, it's not a fair fight. It's, and, and I, I don't mean that by any, it has nothing to do with me or you. Or oh no. Your point is it's all ESPN and just whatever it's, you know, uh, right. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure if the NFL network actually wanted to help me out with something, they would, but uh, here I am by myself. Uh, but that's, <laughs> that's a discussion for another day. Um, so, enough. Yeah. So first question I always ask people uh, on the podcast and, and just as a kind of a jumping off point before we really get into your story of how you made your career into what it was. How did you first, you know, fall in love with with football or or fantasy football in this case? What, what Where did that begin? I had already been playing fantasy sports. So when I was 14 years old, uh, I was it was probably 1984. And there was a book that had come out called Rotisserie League Baseball, which was written by the Daniel Okren and the Founding Fathers, and it was about how to play fantasy baseball. So that's how I got into it, was I had, and I've told this story before, but the, in, in essence, there was a, um, uh, I, I was actually pretty good at tennis as a, as, a young, as a young kid. And so I took private tennis lessons. And so walking up to my tennis lesson one day, my tennis coach, this guy, Tommy Cannell, was talking with his best friend, a guy named Don Smith, about guys they could ask to join. And I like heard them talking. I'm like, are you guys talking about rotisserie league baseball? And they're like, you've heard of it? And I'm like, yeah, you guys had? Because it was, you know, there was no internet or anything like back then. Like just, you had to have bought this book. And I was just a, a sports nerd that read every book I could find. And so uh, I joined at that, I joined what I've come to later find out because I've I've met Daniel Oakland. I've met some of these people. I was in one of the first 50 fantasy baseball leagues ever in America. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, the, and that league, by the way, still continues to this day. Uh, next weekend, I will fly back to Texas for the 32nd annual Fat Dog Rotisserie League auction uh, mm -hmm. with six of the original 10 members still there 32 years later. So it's kind of cool. So I was already a big fantasy fan and I played that. Uh, but when I got to college, a, um, but I'd never done football for whatever reason. Again, this is, and I was always a huge football fan, but that was sort of the sport I'd been introduced to with fantasy wise. So in college, which I went to college from 88 to 92, so somewhere in there, uh, I went to Syracuse. 
a, a kid that I was friends with, a guy named AJ Mass, who now actually writes for us here at ESPN.com, uh, was forming a, a fantasy football league among a bunch of us. There was a bunch of us that worked at the student TV station at Syracuse. So he asked me to join that league if I would. And it was going to be a dynasty league and um, it's like a half point PPR. There's all sorts of kind of weird rules in the league. Uh, and so I did. And that league, by the way, is still going to this day. So, you know, it's in year 26 or 27 with pretty much everyone. This year. I think like of the I think 10 of the original 12 members, something like that, nine of the original 12. So that was my first exposure to fantasy football and loved it. You know, that league is older than me. Yeah. Um I always. Of, I probably have shirts older than you, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm old. I'm old. Yes. Yeah. Well, no. I mean, one thing for this podcast is this, it's that Barry is old. <laughs> when I first when I first met uh, when I met Sigmund Bloom for the first time, uh, you know, and I, he was a guest, first guest on the podcast. I long have said that he's like my my mentor, my dad in the industry. He told me right away. He said, "Always make sure to." rub in your your youth before it's used against you so i always try to slip that in at one point during the podcast Sigmund is a very smart man so uh, i would i would heed his advice there you go yeah no doubt about that and it's actually funny because much like our last guest which was matt franciscovich uh who works with me at nfl.com you kind of came from a different background in terms of writing than you weren't just a sports writer you were actually doing something else so before you were matthew berry the sports writer what was your career there I was a Hollywood screenwriter, in essence. So I'd been doing, uh, you know, again, like you just heard, like I've been playing since I was 14 years old, you know. Um, uh, so I've been playing some form of fantasy sports for over 30 years, 32 years. Uh, and I've been playing fantasy football for, I guess, you know, two and a half decades. Um, but in 1999, I mean, I guess I was a screenwriter. I should have just answered your question. Uh, I was a screenwriter. I was a Hollywood screenwriter is what I was. So I wrote for TVs and movies for a long time. I went to Syracuse University, graduated in 92, moved out to Hollywood, spent two years being a, a PA, which it stands for production assistant, which is in essence a go glorified gopher. I got mm. scripts. I got lunch. I answered phones. I cleaned up. I drove scripts around. I... I just did all the grunt work that you could. One of the ones, one of the shows that I was a PA for was the George Carlin show, and I was the stage PA. So in essence, I was George Carlin's assistant for the first year of the George Carlin show. So that was one of my first jobs out of Hollywood, which was really cool, working for George. But yeah, so I spent two years just basically being a grunt, writing scripts, trying to get a break, eventually got a break, started writing a bunch of sitcoms, eventually transitioned into writing movies, and I was doing that at the time that... Uh, I was able to make a full-time living at fantasy. So that's, that's what I was doing before fantasy. So like, uh, what was there, was there anything about that career path that like didn't sit well with you that kind of pushed you into fantasy sports or anything like that? Pretty much all of it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to turn the, the podcast into a whole diatribe of uh, anti Hollywood, but oh, you can, I mean, I live, I live in Los Angeles now and you know, I, 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 I'm okay with you turning it into that. I'm, there's a lot of great things about show business in Hollywood, and I still have a lot of friends that are there. But the frustrating thing for me was is that it was so random. And by that, I mean that so much of your success was out of your own out of your own hands. And I just couldn't handle that. And which is weird because now I'm in a career in fantasy where again, you know, it's just like, you love a guy and he steps out of bounds at the ones or some, you know, some other wide receivers holding. And then, you know, your touchdown gets called back. And, you know, there's a lot that's out of your hands in fantasy as well. But, uh, but for whatever reason, I feel more in control in fantasy than I do, uh, than I ever did in Hollywood. And it was just very frustrating because uh, I think I'm a good writer. My writing partner and I, every, every showrunner that we ever worked with, every producer, we always got hired again. Like everyone liked us. You know, we didn't, we did a good job. We could just never seem to get on like that hit show. And it became a, I found that Hollywood was more than any other place, much more of a who you know kind of town. What can you do for me? People, hot, writers were hired because they were fun to hang out with at a bar drinking beer that, as opposed to what was on the written script. There were things that, you know, I would read where you would, where somebody would get hired and be like, this is terrible. They paid half a million dollars for this script. Are you kidding me? This is awful. You know, and like, 
it just there was a lot of different things that sort of um, uh, bothered me about show business. And, you know, there's two stories, one of which I talked about in my book, um, you know, dealt with Crocodile Dundee in Los Angeles. The only movie I ever got made. I mean, this was here's here's a problem with Hollywood. The only movie that I wrote probably 12 different screenplays, you know, that I got paid for, you know, that people like hired me to either rewrite a script or I pit, made a pitch and it, it ended up uh, getting sold or whatever. And the only movie that I, that, that I wrote that got made was frankly the worst one I wrote, which was mm. me in Los Angeles, because it was like this. So when I, in the book, I, I talk about sort of the experience I had with Paul Hogan, which was uh, an unpleasant one and a very frustrating one. And then there was another one where I was, I was doing a, we'd been hired to do a rewrite, my writing partner and I had been hired to do a rewrite of a com a buddy comedy, of two, you know, if I met, if I told you the names, I don't want to say them, but if I told you their names, you'd know who they are. They're, they're both, uh, they're both, you know, well-known comedy stars. Um, and one of whom especially has had a lot of success in movies. And we went to this movie, we went to, we went to have this meeting and this one guy, the, the movie star basically lectured us for an hour and a half on what was funny. Oh, and that's terrific. Right, we we're supposed to have a meeting like about to like get his notes on the script, you know, about like, hey, I think, you know, it's, it's a little slow in the second act and hey, can we beef up the love interest or, you know, those are like typical notes that you kind of thing are like, hey, I'm not great, you know, I'm not real comfortable doing this set piece. Is there something funnier I could do here? That's generally and instead it was just like this hour and a half lecture on comedy and what was funny, which is the, the most useless thing in the world is trying to describe why something is funny. Like I'm a big, it is or it isn't, right? Right. So it was just a, it was just a very annoying meeting. And I'm driving back and I'm all annoyed. and I'm complaining to, I don't know, my wife or my agent or my writing partner or somebody. I'm like bitching on the phone. And I just sort of had this epiphany where I'm like, wow, listen to yourself. You've got an A-list movie star that wants to make a movie that you're writing and you just spend an hour and a half with him, you know, and all he's doing is complain, you know, and, and the meeting was maybe a little annoying. The guy was a little full of himself. Like, that's a high class problem. Right. You know, like we, we, you should be so lucky as to get that opportunity is to be able to write a, you know, being hired by a major studio to, to rewrite a movie that's going to get made by a major comedy star. And I'm like, if I'm complaining about this, like it's never getting better. You know what I mean? Like, I, and I just had this moment, like, what am I doing? I got to get out. And I, I talk about this in my book too, and I'm happy to go into it if you want, but like I just, I was suffering from depression. I was really depressed. I was in therapy and and I just realized that I just, despite the fact that I was very well paid and that I had like a reasonable amount of success in show business as a Hollywood writer. Like I wasn't, wasn't, was like a, you know, I wasn't Aaron Sorkin or anything like that, or, you know, one, a, a famous brand name writer or anything like that. But I was a working writer uh, that was working on pretty good projects that had a good reputation, making pretty good money. And I was miserable. I just hated every every bit of it. The only thing I could think of at the time, I'd started these websites on the side, and I just sort of wanted to. I realized that what I cared when I woke up in the morning and I went to bed at night, all I was thinking about was whether it was my fantasy column or later on my websites. That's what I was thinking about. I was just like, I got to get out. So that was sort of the the transition for me. That those are among the things that I hated about uh, you know Hollywood. It was just sort of the the phoniness and the the fact that it seemed like skill wasn't really rewarded and it was more about schmoozing and just the wrong people were rewarded for the wrong times. And I would open up at the time, this is before everything was online, I would open up like the Hollywood Reporter or Variety, Matt, and I would sit there and I would, I would see like somebody, so-and-so sold a script for this. And I'd be like, that guy, that guy's a <laughs> like, And yeah. I would actually be like, I'd be so bitter and petty and jealous. And I don't believe I'm like that. That's not a, it's certainly not a, a feeling or emotion that I'm proud of. And right. it's certainly not one that I'd ever experienced prior. And I don't think I really experience it now that I'm at ESPN. Like I'm generally happy for people's success. And I'm generally happy for people in the, the fantasy industry. I think I've been pretty good about trying to promote other people's work and, you know, help other people either get to ESPN or get other places in the industry. And um, I just hated how it made me feel every day when yeah. I read through it. And even if, even if I got, even if I had something good going on, there was something else that had somebody, I just, it just was toxic for me. No. And that makes a lot of sense. Like I, 
I share bits and pieces of like my own little story here, I guess. And, you know, I will say that like, it was a time of personal crisis for me too, that gave me the clarity, like that I don't want to do, I don't want to do what I like intended to do. I want to try this. Like, I want to just try writing about football. Like I start, and then I started a blog and just did it. And then it went from there, you know? So it's, it is, I think that sometimes, you know, and I've had, I've had people that listen to the show have reached out to me and have been like, I'm actually going through a really difficult personal time right now, whether, you know, they're, there's trouble at home or, or there's uh you know, they're, they're suffering from, you know, interpersonal demons or whatever. And they've said that, you know, some of the episodes of the podcast have given them that like, you know, maybe this is something I should try to do that can help me get on that path. And I know that that was for me that, that personally, that was pretty much the same situation. I, I want to at some point talk more in depth about it, but this is not, this show's not about me. It's about you and, and all the other people. So we'll see, maybe someday we'll get there, but um, I think you should, you should interview yourself. Yeah, right. That well, that I don't know. An hour of me talking to me uh, would be pretty. That would be pretty dangerous. But um, or, maybe I can get my or have somebody come in and interview you for the uh, yeah for for the actual podcast. But I agree. I mean, listen, I I people are like wow, you were so gutty to like sort of give up. You know, I quit show business to basically make try to make a career of fantasy. I, mean, I guess we can. I don't know if I'm jumping all over the place. If you have specific questions, no, that's me. but people. But the I always say is it's like. It seems gutty, and I guess it was on some level, but honestly, for me, it was like life saving because I just yeah. I was so massively depressed, and I just hated. I was so unhappy, and my hate is the wrong strong word. I, I was so unhappy in my life as a Hollywood screenwriter, and the thing that made me the most happy was fantasy football. So I decided to try to make a go of it full time. So yeah, I say that a lot to to people that um you know that I'm close with and everything. Like do, do I I completely agree with that. Like doing this literally probably saved my life in a lot of ways. Like, so I, I, it's good to hear somebody else say that. So I, I think that, so which kind of going through that transition. So what was, you feel this impetus that you don't, you're not particularly happy in your current, you know, career and everything you want to get out, you know, there's the negative feelings of, of your own inner personal issues going on with yourself. And then also like the negativity that your career is bringing you. What step did you take to kind of make, like take towards a career in fantasy? Well, I already had sort of a, a leg up, so I should go back. Mm -hmm. So in 1999, so I was enamored by fantasy, and I sort of had all these kind of start, starts and stops. And I've written about this a little bit. I've written about I've talked about it. There's a short version of the story and a longer story that's in the book. Um, and so somewhere in between there is like, so I was sort of enamored by this. Like, like I knew some people that knew the Roto News people, which is what RotoWire was called back in the day. They were called Roto News. And like, I was trying to get like an introduction there. And like, I'd met a couple of people there, like some lower level people and sort of like feeling them out. And um, the sporting news was starting up a fantasy section called at the time called fantasy source ended up um, a guy named Matt Pitzer who wrote for sporting news was sort of their big guy. Um, and him and I had become friendly over email. Uh, I asked him, hey, could you introduce me to your boss? You know, this seems sort of interesting. And it was like sort of cool. And I had a conversation with a guy um, and he was open to hiring me, um, but I would have had to move to St. Louis. Um, like, and um, and I just, I couldn't, you know, my wife had, I, at the time I was married and was living in LA and she had a job and I just couldn't move to LA, St. Louis. The amount of money they want, I would have taken a massive pay cut, which I was actually okay with, but you know, my wife couldn't leave her job. And so I ended up having right. to pass there. So I, but I was looking around and then at the time, Roto World, this is 1999. Roto World was looking for writers. They literally put an ad on Roto World. And this is, you have to remember 1999 that you may not even, given your age, but in 1999, um, you know, it was AOL and CompuServe and Prodigy and you had to dial up to get to the internet. It wasn't automatic. And I mean, like the whole, like, you've got mail. Like that was a thing. Like people mm. were actually excited. Like it was a novel thing. Like, oh, I've got an email. This is cool. <laughs> like it wasn't like now it's a hassle. <laughs> right now it's a hassle. You're like, oh god, another one. But like, I mean, they made a whole movie over it. Like Tom Hanks. Yeah. Like, ooh, I've got some mail. Like, I mean, like so. Um, so this is '99. So you had to dial up to get on the internet and everything like that. But I, um, uh, so I, uh, they were advertising for writers. Hey, do you want? It? We're looking for writers for the site for Roto World. And I emailed in. Got nothing back. 
emailed, uh, you know, and my email was like, Hey, I'm a professional writer living out here in Hollywood. Uh, you know, fantasy sports, my passion. I would love, I think it'd be so much fun to write for your site, like just on the side, like as a mm -hmm. fantasy expert, could I do a column or something like that? Could I try out? You don't have to pay me. Like I just, I want to do it cause it's my passion. And I, I sent an email, heard nothing back. Sent another email saying like, uh, Hey, don't know if you guys missed this one, but send another one. No, we, no response to that one. Sent a third email where I basically said like, Hey, can someone just reject me just so I know like somebody's at least read this, like, just turn me down. Tell me there's no, I have no chance in hell. No response. I was on the site like every day and I knew that the site was pretty much run by this guy named Matthew Puglio. Like, I don't know how many people appreciate that. He was inducted into the fantasy sports Writers association hall of fame recently, deservedly. So um, in the early days of Roto world, like every update on every player in every sport was Matthew Puglio. Like he was a one man show for a number of years. Like it's unreal when you think about the amount of, and he was like, he was overseeing like some other people that did some columns and anyway, so I knew enough that Matthew Pula was like a big deal at the site. And so at the bottom of his columns, he had an, an email address. So I just emailed him directly and I said, Hey, I have an advice question, but one that you probably don't get all the time. Um, I don't want to know about how to win fantasy. I want to know how do I get a job with you guys? And I told him what I just told you. I can't seem to get an answer. Do you know who's doing the hiring at Roto World? Can you forward them my email? And he wrote me back and he said, actually, I am. I'm the guy doing the hiring. That inbox has just been so over flooded. I haven't had a chance to go through everything. Like, it's just nuts. I'm the only guy here. It's me. Um, he says, but I looked you up on IMDb. Married with Children is my favorite show of all time. You're hired. <laughs> so because I go. Married with Children, I got... I got a job at Roto World and, and I was just like, I think this is important. I think this is important to sort of tell aspiring people out there that's, and when I ran my own site later, I would use this piece of advice. I said to, you know, Puglio, I said like, Hey, do you, do you want to take a test? You know, do you want me to like take a test to know that I know what I'm doing in terms of fantasy, especially back then, you know, it was like very, and uh, you know, do you, you want to talk to me? And he's just like, nah, he says, the readers will tell us. He's like, if you're not any good, they won't read you. And that'll be that. But, you know, if you're willing to work for free, I don't care. I'll throw you up there. You know, you obviously have, you know, good, you know, you, you're a semi-professional writer, you know, like whatever. And uh, so I'm happy to give you a opportunity. We'll put your column up there. And if you're any good, people will read you. And if you aren't, they won't, you know, and if more people read you the, the week after versus less, then we're on to something, you know, and if, if they don't like you, if your advice is any good and they stop tuning you out, then that'll be that. And if you're any good, you know, you keep the job. Okay. Yeah, it is important to appeal to your readers. That's for sure. Um, that's something I get a lot, actually. That's a kind of, kind of an interesting spinoff from that. Do you think it's more important? Because I actually have an inner debate with myself ab about this a lot, but also like I've gone back and forth with people that follow me on Twitter. This is like a kind of a completely side question. But do you think it's more important for a for a, a fantasy analyst to be good at fantasy or be a good writer? I think it's more important to be a good writer, but I wouldn't even use the phrase writer. Mm. I think it's more important to be a good communicator. Okay, that makes sense. Because, and this is something I say, and I think this is the most important thing in the world. <clears throat> um, it doesn't matter how good your fantasy analysis is. If you can't communicate it clearly, concisely in at least a semi entertaining way that you just, you're that eyes aren't glazing over then it doesn't matter. You know what I mean? Like if, if you could be Albert Einstein, you know, and, and have the theory of relativity, but if you can't explain it to anyone, what does it matter? So I think the most right. important aspect, I think it's very, I think both are very important, but if you're asking me for me in terms of fantasy analyst, uh, I think it's much more important to be able to communicate. I think it's more important to be able to communicate than it is to be a good fantasy analyst. Because if you're a good fantasy analyst who can't communicate, it doesn't matter. No one's going to be understanding what you're saying. Yeah. That's so, typically the answer that I give people that ask, ask me the question too. So like, I'll just say this, like, and I, like I, I have not, you and I, this is the first time I'm actually laying eyes on you. Okay. Like you and I have met, oh, met over Twitter. Right. Um, and I think your tweets are, 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 are smart. I started following you because it's like, oh, this guy seems sharp. 
you know, and um, I saw other people that I respect, you know, engaging with you, Sigmund Bloom being one of them. But um, but I know nothing about you other than that. Like, you know, you mentioned reception perception. I got no idea what that is. Sorry. No, that's OK. But but here's my point. But all I was going to say is, is like I got down on the um, I got down on this podcast to see and I'm looking at you and I'm hearing you. And within 30 seconds, I was like, I get it in terms of you. Like if I was a hiring, I'd be like, all right, young, good looking guy, deep voice, clean cut, speaks clearly, sold. Seriously, like that's but I, I'm, I'm being I'm being genuine there because yeah. it's like like I know pretty quickly and fairly easily, you know, I can sort of I've been doing this for a while. Right. So like I'm not surprised at all that NFL Network hired you. And I, I feel confident in saying that had they not hired you, someone else would have fairly uh, uh, fairly quickly because it, it all, you know. From what I've read of your of your of your tweets and how you present yourself on Twitter and how I've I've seen you interact with me here and just seeing you like done easy you communicate well. I mean, you just uh, you had me a good looking. Uh, you could have st- <laughs> you could have stopped Break there, up. but no. Let's, let's see what's going on later. Yeah, but exactly. Well, I appreciate. No, seriously, I, obviously, I appreciate that. That's I jokingly say, uh, half jokingly say that I mostly just bring people on this podcast to boost my own ego. But no, seriously, that is I, that's that's an honor for you to say that. That's I, I that means a lot. But it is true. I mean, you get a sense of people who they are, how they present themselves in their work, and you know, on Twitter and everything like that. And you know, it is important, and that is one thing that I think we've talked about a lot on the show is like how to present yourself on social media, and you know, some of the mistakes that people make because there are definitely some people that I've I've met, you know, I've met them in real life after knowing them on Twitter, and I'm like, oh, they're you know, they're exactly the same person, right. you know, as as how they present themselves. Actually, that was I've mentioned this before, but I wrote my undergrad thesis in college, and what I intended to do with my career path was to extrapolate the theory. Like, I wrote a bunch of presentation of self theories on Twitter and like taking old social theories and reimagining them for the digital age. So it's a, it is really funny how much a lot of that stuff is actually true. Um, but anyways, I, so yeah, it's an important thing to, to be a good communicator, to effectively. Hey Matt, I, you, like you're breaking up. I don't know if that's you or me. I had to move my iPad here cause I was running out of battery. Oh, like is I, it, is it better know. now or? Huh? Is it better now or? Not really. It's going in and out. And I don't know if it's me. If I moved it into near something now here, I'm trying to do this. I don't know. I can I can hear you okay. Okay. All right. As long as you guys can hear me okay, like I'll, I'll muddle through. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you were saying about in terms of people, how they present themselves on social media and Twitter and you've met people and yeah. Right. It's just, you can get, you can get a sense for people of how they, how they present themselves. And I think that is very important to be a good communicator and be effective in that regard. But going back to your story, so you, you get, you've got a, you got a a thing going on at Roto World here. What's, what's kind of the, where does that transition into getting you towards ESPN or what, what's the, what's the fill in the blanks there? Well, I mean, it's a long one. So, right. So I wrote, you know, I wrote for Roto World and it's, you know, I, I was trying to come up with a nickname for myself. I mean, this is, here's a piece of advice, which, uh, you know, seems sort of obvious and a little bit dumb, but helped me out a great deal completely by accident, which was, um, so on Roto World at the time, most of the columns they had were fairly generic. And I thought, um, at least certainly in the titles, terrible (laughs) red zone, first and 10, you know, balls and strikes. Those were the, like the names of the columns. And I'm just like, eh. And I knew I wanted to write multiple sports because I was playing at the time fantasy baseball, basketball, and football. And I wanted something that stood out. And so I'm writing for Roto World, Roto standing for rotisserie, which is, it's, you know, before it was fantasy, it was called rotisserie. And so I wanted something with Roto in the title. And I wanted something that stood out that made me sound like an expert. But to be honest, not something that, I took myself too seriously because I knew I'm, I'm sort of a goofy guy and I knew the, the tone of my column would not be like super, super stat heavy or, you know, hardcore. It would just be more fun. And, and uh, so I was sitting there trying to come up with names with Roto and I'm like, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the Roto czar, the, you know, Lord of Roto, Dr. Roto, Mr. Roto, all these terrible, hacky, obvious, terrible things. You know? And so I'm sitting there and I'm just like, uh, and I was like, I, I tried the Roto whore because I was in so many leagues 
And uh, Roto World actually said no. They wanted a family friendly name. So I'm coming up, I'm trying to switch it. And then my wife and I, my then wife and I had seen the talented Mr. Ripley with Matt Damon in the movie. And I'm coming up with those names. And my wife's like, what about the talented Mr. Roto? And I'm like, hilarious. Soul. Perfect. Never, of course, thinking that, you know, 17 years later, that would be my career and anything like that. But I thought that's a name that sort of stands out. But it's, you know, and it sounds like an expert, but it's obviously goofy. It's so over the top and tongue in the cheek, the talented Mr. Ro like it's, you know, kind of goofy and dumb. Anyway, so I did that. But but that was something, Matt, that helped me out a great deal in terms of branding. I, I think that's um, uh, something that's important in terms of because there's ultimately there's there's only so many ways. And it's something that it sounds like what you're trying to do with like reception, perception and that kind of stuff like there's only we're all looking at the same stats, the same film, the same players, right? It's a finite group. And so whatever you can do to make yourself again, it's an entertainment business, right? It's 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 not just about um, giving great fantasy analysis. It's giving it great fantasy analysis in a way that is interesting and palatable and digestible for people that don't have a ton of time that aren't paid to do this the way we are. And so uh, I think that's actually something that's uh, important. As people, you know, and just sort of what's your persona is the wrong word, but um, what's something that, you know, uh, readers or listeners or viewers can sort of hang on to in terms of what you do? Uh, in terms yeah, whether of it's, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, right. but, but yeah, whether it's content, like, yeah, I mean, perception, perception is obviously like, that's a, you know, I guess, analytics methodology that I've come up with. That's something you can do to stand out. But it, it does, like, like you said, it doesn't have to necessarily be. But something like that. But reception perception, which rhymes, is more interesting, more palatable than analytics. You know, yeah. like you know, right? The, you to, know, to, well, to, yeah. To tell the story of that, I actually, when I was, you know, coming up with the idea back, you know, a couple of years ago, when I was first, you know, getting my feet into the industry and all that. I was like, I need a name for this, but if there's something, I am not. That's not something I'm good at. I'm actually terrible at. Uh, at naming things and everything. So, you know, if it had been up to me, it would have been something stupid like Harmon's methodology for evaluating receivers. So I posted it on Facebook, like, and asked my friends, I was like, hey, anybody got a good name for this? And somebody shot back reception perception. And I, yeah, I ran with it. Right. Bingo, bango. So, right. So, anyway, what ended up happening on Roto World, just to try to fill in some of the blanks there, is so I did a couple of different things, um, which was, while I was at Roto World, I had an idea for a website called Roto Pass, which still to this day exists. So rotopass.com. And so the idea was, and if you're interested, I can get into how I came up with the idea for that. But I came up with this idea for Roto Pass. Um, and so uh, I was sort of working on that. In 2002, there was a guy named Steve Mason. You probably know if you're living in L.A. So Mason and Ireland, they do... Uh, you know, they're, they're hosts on uh, 710 ESPN out in L.A. So Steve Mason at the time was working for Fox Sports Radio. And he was a big fantasy guy and he was a fan of my column. And so his producer like emailed in and asked like, hey, do you want to come be on the radio? Would you like to come to a fantasy segment with me? Um, and so I, you know, I was like, yeah, sure. And uh, so I did that. And here's an important I think piece of advice I, I can give people listening. So I know that, I, you know, I don't know where you live in LA, but I lived in Sherman Oaks. I lived in, um, in the Valley. And I knew that the Fox sports radio studios were right there on um, Ventura and um, what's that? Sepulveda. Yep. Basically on the corner of Ventura and Sepulveda. So literally five minutes from my house, I would drive by it every day. And so when they emailed in a uh, producer, a guy named Harry Gore, Harry emailed and said, you know, do you want to, call in and I said yeah I'm happy to you know call in and do this segment and this was a big deal by the way because back then this is again 2002 something like that 2003 um, people weren't really putting fantasy on the radio that much you know it certainly wasn't on TV uh, and so to do something for Fox Sports Radio National this was this was great and I said uh, I said to Harry I said how about if I come by I'm like it's just a five minute segment you know you don't need to drive all the way over here you know, in person, you know, just we'll call you. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, but it'll sound better if I'm in person, right? I don't mind. I'm happy to come drive. And they're like, oh, yeah, dude, I guess you want to come by and knock yourself out. Like, I'm sure he's rolling his eyes. Like, what the? And the truth is, is that, like, 
obviously I wanted the segment to be as good as possible and I wanted it to sound as good as possible, but I didn't really care about that. What I really wanted to do was I'm a believer that, and now more than ever, you know, personal connections is, is so important. Right. So instead of like, you know, with email and Twitter, it can, it's so easy to be impersonal. What I want to do was by going there. So I go there and I get there like five, 10 minutes early and I meet Harry, the producer, and we shake hands and I meet the engineer and we shake hands and blah, blah, blah. And they're asking me questions about their fantasy team. And then, you know, they cut to commercial and then they bring me in. Steve, this is Matthew Berry. Hey, how are you? Nice to meet you. Oh, thanks for having me on. Okay. Yeah. Here's my headphones. Okay. Great. Let's do this. And we do a segment, you know. And then, you know, the, the segment was probably supposed to go five minutes. I think we probably went eight, you know, because I'm sitting there. And then, you know, the segment's over. All right, we'll be back with whoever after this. Hey, that was great. Thanks so much. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime you want me, you know, blah, blah. And now, like, now I'm not just some guy on the end of the phone. All right, that was Matthew Berry. Thanks so much. But now I'm somebody they've met, right? And they, you know, now I'm some nice kid that they've met that's shaking hands. and like, oh, he's polite. And it was better in, in studio and his energy. And so... You know, and that ended up leading to, you know, and it went well and we got a ton of calls and people really liked it. And so like one segment ended up leading to two segments, ended up leading to, uh, you know, why don't you come in for the hour? Um, eventually, Steve like had to do some weekend stuff and said, hey, do you want to co-host with me? So, you know, Steve Mason did a tremendous amount to help my career. He's done that with a number of people. Michelle Tafoya is another guy, another woman that got the, got uh, her start thanks to Steve Mason. He's he's launched a number of careers. Um but, uh, but more importantly, it just, you know, it got me reps. And what I did was once I was inside the door at Fox Sports Radio, starting to do more and more and getting to know those people, who's the program director. And I started, you know, and I would, it was a guy named Andrew Ashwood. And I went to Andrew Ashwood and I would say like, hey, fantasy's blown up. Can we do this? And it would, I would constantly pitch him ideas about different ways to do fantasy. And eventually ended up getting hired to be the Fox Sports Radio fantasy expert. Hmm. And I want to say they paid me 200 bucks a week. I didn't care. Again, it was just being able to, it was two things. Number one is for me to be able to now say that in addition to Roto World, I was the Fox Sports Radio fantasy expert. And what it meant was mostly on Sundays, this is an idea I'd pitched, was like, you know how they do those updates, you know, the right. minute long updates where I was like, well, why don't you come to me once an hour and I'll sort of just talk about, you know, fantasy updates. Again, this is, this is before Twitter, this is before people are really... Um, you know, getting information on their on their cell phones or anything like that. Um, and so I would, you know, I'd be the guy that'd be like, you know, whatever, um, you know, so and so, Randall Cunningham or whatever, you know, whoever it was, right? You know, Ladainian Tomlinson rushed for this many yards, and blah 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 blah, <coughs> and sort of give stats updates um, of you know what s certain players had done from a fantasy perspective, and they liked that, and. Um, I did that, and then eventually Steve went over to uh, ESPN Radio here in Los Angeles, and I was talking to him, and um, uh, I was uh, I was talking to Steve and everything like that. And uh, um, by the way, I'm I'm, I'm interrupting this because I'm worried that my uh, we may have to pause this because no, I, that's I just, okay. My iPad says five percent left, so if it goes dead, we'll figure out another way. Um, uh, I'll do it on my phone or something like that. But uh, Steve got over to ESPN Radio in LA, and you know, I I asked him to introduce me to the program director there, and I'm pitching fantasy stuff to that guy, uh, the late great Ray Caru uh, Ray Calusa, and um, you know, they were like, oh, let's do some fantasy stuff, and like Steve was like, well, if you want to do some fantasy stuff, you got to meet my guy, and he brought me over there and introduced me to Ray, and I pitched him a bunch of different fantasy football stuff, and eventually I ended up doing. Um, a uh, doing some obviously I was doing stuff on Steve's show, but I did something called Fantasy Football Friday Night. Uh, myself and a guy named Jason Smith, who uh, used to work at NFL.com, used to work with me here at ESPN. Now he works, he's back at Fox Sports Radio. And so Jason Smith and I would do Fantasy Football Friday Night, uh, and we did that for like two years. And you know, and and so this is I think hopefully informative to some people in terms of you know not just accepting opportunity but but once you're in the door somewhere you know trying to make the most of that opportunity so once i was so along the way there's a couple of things that are happening concurrently here um but along the way uh i basically decided to leave roto world and start my own website two websites i started to start roto pass and town's mr roto and i can explain 
there's a lot more detail in the book if you if you're really interested in this um uh uh in my book fantasy life but um so i could get into the starting those two websites but in essence just know that i'm starting those two websites on the side while all this is happening for sure so what was the impetus for leaving roto world and kind of going independent oh um frank well so here's this story but anyway so that's the, once I got into ESPN Radio, that was how I sort of made my way into ESPN, and I can talk right. further about that if you care. But to, to answer your question about Roto World and and that, so I had this idea for again at this point, this is probably 2000, late 2003, uh, early 2004. It has not occurred to me at all that I can make a living doing this full time. Sure. I have a meeting with a friend of mine who's a big internet guy. I had this idea for Roto Pass. Let's, so I came up with this idea for Rotopass, which is a conglomerate of sites that you you pay one price and you get access to a bunch of premium fantasy football sites um, for much less than it would cost to buy them all separately. In essence, like a bundle, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, and like so, Rotopass still exists. It's you know, it's like it's football guys and Rotowire and ESPN Insider and Pro Football Focus and Rotoviz and uh, and so. Um, so anyway, so I have this idea, but I know nothing about the internet. And this is very, again, this is very like, you're still sort of dialing up. People haven't totally figured out how to make money on the internet. And I met with a, a friend of mine who uh, had started a very, very successful, very famous internet company, which if I, like it's still to this day. And so I met with him and I'm like, I know nothing about you know, SEO or tagging or linking or I know none, none of this stuff. I, Still, frankly, don't. But I meet with them and I say, like, I'm asking for advice. I'm like, okay, so I'm launching this website, this rotopass.com website. What do I do? And um, and so uh, they said, uh, one of the guys that he said to me, one of the things that this guy said to me was, he said, um, we, we had all sorts of sort of technical talk, but he said, well, who's the guy? I said, what do you mean, who's the guy? And he said, Who's the guy? He says, I don't play fantasy. I don't understand your industry. He's like, but there's got to be a guy. There's got to be some, every industry has a guy that when you think of that industry, you think of that person. Like, he's just like, I, who's the, I don't know, who's the, the Martha Stewart of fantasy football, right? And I'm like, no one to be candid. Like, you know, like as somebody who's played for a long time, I mean, you know, a lot of people know who Ron Chandler is. Um, you know, Eric Carabell at ESPN or Brandon Funston at Yahoo or, you know, two guys that sort of come to mind for me. But I don't know that, you know, all due respect to all three people who are all friends of mine. And, um, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that any of them had broken, you know, through in a big way that they were synonymous with fantasy football. Um, and I said, so I don't know, you know, no one, to be honest. Cause he, and I'm like, why? He's like, well, whoever that guy is, you should get that guy to promote Rotopass. And I'm like, ah, well, there isn't a guy. And so then he says to me, well, why don't you become that guy? I'm like, me? And he goes, well, how long have you been playing? I'm like, you know, since I was 14. He's like, how long have you been doing it professionally? And at that point, I'm like, seven years. At that point, I'd been getting a paycheck to give fantasy analysis for seven years. You know, and I'd done it on the radio, and I'd done it for, you know, at that point I'd written for, um, I think I'd done some, no, I hadn't done sporting news yet, but I'd done Roto World for a long time, and Fox Sports Radio. And he says, well, your credentials are as good as anyone's. You should try to turn yourself into that guy. So I was like, that's kind of an interesting idea. I hadn't really thought about that. So so I had that in the back of my mind. And I, um, I started slipping links for uh, Rotopass into my column on Roto World. Because back in the day, back then, you could just sort of post your column on Roto World. Mm-hmm. And um, and they called so um, telling the story out of order. Sorry, it's been a while. So uh, so in essence, basically, so while I'm starting Roto Pass, while I'm starting Roto Pass, um, I had talked to my bosses at Roto World about is there some sort of partnership, some sort of linking kind of thing. And they said no. And then they sort of said um, uh, they said actually um, we want to talk to you. And I said what's that? And they said, we'd like you to take a pay cut. What? At that point, I was I was writing two columns a week for $100 a week. I was getting mm. 50 bucks a column. And um, 
uh, and so I, I, yeah, it was getting fifty dollars a column, and uh, and I said, how much do you want to pay me? And they said twenty five dollars a week. We're trying to cut costs. You know, at this point, like people still haven't figured out how to make money on the internet. The only people that were really making money were people that were running gambling ads, and they didn't. Rotor World didn't want to do that, and that money ended up drying up pretty quickly too. And uh, like offshore betting ads. And so uh, he said to me, uh, I, I'm like, so after four and a half years, you want to cut my pay by 300%. And he's just like, well, when you say it like that, it sounds bad. Well, and it might be bad. <laughs> I'm like, because it is. Yeah. Screw you guys. And it's not like the, the $100 a week made a difference in my life, but it was the principle of the matter. And I was their most popular writer by far. Like they had told me previously, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. the number of clicks my column got versus the other columnists. And, and like, you know, and I was, I was the guy doing the radio for them. And, and I'm like, you know, I've busted my butt for this site and I'm promoting you guys on Fox Sports and I'm doing all this stuff. And like, I'm doing it, you know, sort of for the love of the game and like, you know, and he's just like, well, sorry, that's, you know. So it's like, instead of telling him basically to F off, I said, let me think about it. And I had all this going on in the back of my mind. So in essence, what I started doing was uh, I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to go. And I ended up talking to Peter Shanky, um, at Rotowire, uh, my friend. I actually talked to um, uh, some of the guys. That, there was a site called KFFL back in the day. Um, and so I was talking to them about maybe coming over. I was trying to figure out where I was going to land. And, um, and uh, you know, would you be interested in bringing me on and, and what have you? And, and so... While I did this, again, this is before Twitter, before Facebook, everything like that, I created a Yahoo group for myself, okay? And so I don't know if you remember, I don't know if it's still the way, but back then, you, anyone could create a Yahoo fan group, if you would. And, um, and so uh, the, um, the whole point of the Yahoo fan group was it was free, but you had to give an email address to join the, join the fan group. So... I wrote, this was right around the start of baseball season. So I basically put in my column, and like I said, on that day, those days in Roto World, you could just post the column yourself. So I posted the column myself, and I put in there at the bottom of my column, I said something like, hey, guys, I've written my draft day manifesto this year, and it's free. You don't have to pay for it as part of the draft kit. It's free, but you have to go to this Yahoo group. And I sent a link to the Yahoo group. And it runs for like three or four weeks. So on one hand, I was sort of depressed, like, wow, apparently no one at Roto World is reading my column. <laughs> um, but beyond that, and I probably threw a link into RotoPass too. I, I'm trying to remember. Oh, I, I didn't throw a link into RotoPass at that point. It was just a link to the Yahoo group. And so, um, and my whole point was, I just wanted to suck as many email addresses out of Roto World as I could out of my column. Because I was pissed. I mean, at four and a half years, they want to yeah. take me from 100 to 25 bucks. Like, it's kind of BS. Um and so I ended up getting like about 6,000 kids, which back in those days for one little link for a Yahoo group, you know, the bottom of my column was actually pretty good numbers. And, um, and so Rotor World eventually noticed that. And they said, uh, hey, why don't you tell all your Yahoo guys to come over here and, you know, we'll put a forum on Rotor World. And I'm like, nah, they wanted me to come back. And I'm like, nah, and we went back and forth. And eventually we came to an agreement where I would come back and write for them. I would come back and write for Roto World, uh, with the, and they didn't have to pay me at all. They didn't have to pay me the 25 bucks a week, but they had to link to my website. Hmm. They had to link to um, my uh, Roto Pass, and they agreed to that, which, you know, in hindsight, it's hilarious because a link from them is worth so much more than stupid 25 bucks a, a week. But right. They were so happy to save that money. All right, so... So anyway, so now I'm still trying to figure out what I want to do. And the whole point of sucking all those email addresses was my point was that I was going to email everyone and said, hey, guys, I've left RotoWorld. I'm now going to RotoWire or wherever I was going, right? But what I noticed was that certain people started on this website, on this message board that I had, were like, would they would you could post messages. And it sort of became this de facto message board. People would be like, hey, TMR, wondering, I've got this keeper question, blah, 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 blah. And before I could get back, there'd be other people that would say, like, well, I'm not Matthew, but here's what I would do, blah, 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 blah. And then so it sort of all of a sudden became this, like, this little community. And as I'm reading through these message board posts, I'm like, wow, there's actually some really good writers here. Hmm. And I come up with the idea. I said, I'm going to form my own website, Talented Mr. Roto. 
And the whole point, Matt, is all I want to do is make Talented Mr. Roto free, and it's going to be a big advertisement for Roto Pass. That's like my big plan. Right. The enormity and the entirety of my roto, my my big brilliant business plan is that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to try to get, I'm going to have talented Mr. Roto website. It's going to just be a big huge advertisement for Roto Pass, and I'm going to try to upsell you to Roto Pass. So I just start hiring kids, and I say to them, I can't hire, I can't pay anything. You know, I didn't, I didn't go in and raise money for the site. I, I started it with like 10,000 bucks of my own money. I said, I can't pay anything. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm sort of bootstrapping this thing. Um, but if you want, you can come. You'll be a fantasy expert for me. And we're going to do this site. And um, I'm proud to say that a number of the people, um, among the very first people that were in my, on that website, Brad Evans, who's obviously now at Yahoo. Yeah, right. Um, so uh, Brad, I found Brad on a Yahoo message board. Um, and a guy named Pierre Bequet, who wrote for me under the name of Pete Becker, but who now runs fantasy editorial for ESPN here. So those were two of the first five guys that I hired um, from my message board. And a number of people that started with me that were there initially, like in the first year, you know, um, you know, I, I just mentioned AJ, you know, AJ Mass, who writes for us here, uh, Will Brinson who writes for CBS yep. Sports. He started with me, Andy Behrens, who's obviously now at Yahoo doing great. Nando DeFino um, didn't really start with me. He had been featured in Fantasyland, the book, um, but he'd never really written fantasy advice before. He came on, he wrote for me. Uh, Christopher Harris, we found Christopher Harris on, um, on our message boards. He won a competition that we had. And obviously he left us and went to Yahoo. And then from Yahoo, I brought him over to ESPN and now he's doing his own thing. Um, uh, you know, a number of the people that do like, if you go to ESPN and you look at some of like our hockey and our baseball, John Cregan and Brian McKittish and Victoria Mateish and Sean Allen, people that write sh- like uh, uh, basketball and um, hockey for us uh, mm-hmm. started started with me as well. Um, uh, Guy Lake, who now runs fantasy product for Yahoo, he oversees their fantasy department in essence was a fantasy basketball columnist for me way back in the day. So uh, I, I really lucked into like a ton of talent, you know, and I would love to say it's something um, that I did. I'm, I mostly was smart enough to be like, Oh, Brad Evans, you're a smart, interesting writer. You know, want to, you know, that's what I did. Yeah. So, so, so I don't want to jump in. I don't, I want to kind of jump in on, on one point there. Um, you've, you've mentioned, you know, obviously like you creating this community of writers that has been, that have gone on and webbed off into other things. And you mentioned up at the top, like, and this is something I really like respect about. You, just, you don't see a lot of like bigger named writers in the industry, like, you know, farming out for other interesting things. Like people, you know, it's, I'm talking about like now, not back then, but like yeah. now I've seen you do that. Like, you know, like you said, like with me, it's like, oh, this guy said something interesting. Like, oh, you know, tweet it out or like, like Evan Silva does that a lot. Like he promote, like he's obviously one of the bigger name people out there, but he promotes a lot of smaller stuff. So can you kind of talk about why that's important? Because there is a lot of people and, you know, I wouldn't name any names that don't do that. Like just kind of sit on their ivory tower of success. But why is it important for you to, to kind of create that community? Well, I mean, it goes back to, so, I mean, just to finish that story, and I think I'll answer your question in finishing that story, right? So I use them, it's the same thing that the same reason that Matthew Puglio gave me a shot, right? I mean, you know, I'm not here, I'm not who I am if it wasn't for Matthew Puglio. And, um, and so I thought it was important for me. And the same sort of thing, like I saw somebody interesting, I gave them a shot and gave them a platform. And then, you know, they ran, ran with that opportunity and took it. And I think it's important because two reasons. Number one is, I think it's um, it, it certainly benefit. It's there's three reasons to do it, maybe even four. Um, number one is so the reason I did it right was uh, just sort of just finish the story and then I'll, I'll get back to your answer. But so basically, what I did was I, I just grabbed all these guys and said, "Do you want to come write for me?" So we slapped up a site, the Towns of Mr. Roto site, and again, like I didn't even care. I'm like, just go write. Like I just didn't even care about the quality of the site. Because the whole point of the site was to be an advertisement for Rotopass. You were going to come to the site, and then I was going to upgrade you to the good stuff on Rotopass. And uh, 
And about three months in, you know, seeing stuff like from guys like Brad or Pierre and, and, and some of the other guys that we had, I'm like, oh, wow, this actually, the site's actually really good. And so about three months in, um, I, uh, I sort of switched um, focus and made Towns and Mr. Roto my focus. Going back again to the conversation uh, that I had with my friend, the, the, uh, the website expert, and tried to make everything about me and tried to, you know, I realized that my upsell plan wasn't really working and that the Towns Mr. Roto site was actually pretty good, that I'd managed to luck into a bunch of really great writers and analysts. And, um, and so could I foster, you know, help them out, give them some advice, you know, try to um, shape their analysis and also just, uh, you know, do more about the site, make that site a big community. And, um, you know, in the process and being very open about this, try to make it all about me, right? And, and try to, you know, frankly, help myself. And so to answer your question, why is it important? I think it's important just karmically. I think it's important just to be a good person. Like, again, like right. I got here because you know, because Matthew Puglio helped me. I helped guys like Pierre Bacay or Brad Evans or Andy Barons or Will Brinson, um, Nana DeFino. And all those guys have gone, you know, all those guys, I know, I know each one of those people have helped other people, right? So it's all just sort of pay it forward. You know, I know there are people that Brad has helped. I know there are people that Pierre has helped. I know there's people that Will Brinson has helped, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I think that's important. And then, um, so I think that's important. I think it's important, by the way, for you. So like, so I have, um, I certainly think that my success has reflected well on Matthew Puglio. So ultimately, Matthew Puglio helped me out, not for any other reason other than he wanted some help on the site. He liked me and everything like that. But in the end of the day, I think it's actually reflected well on him. And that's been... You know, uh, when he was inducted into the Fantasy Sports Writers uh, Hall of Fame, among the many accomplishments that were mentioned were that he had been, you know, he'd been one of the guys that he'd given me my start. He'd given Greg Rosenthal his start. I think he'd given Evan Silva his start. You know, like there were there's a long list of people that came out of from Matthew's coaching tree, if you will. Right. And so mm -hmm. um, and the same thing, like it has been a boon to my career. It's certainly a, a feather in my cap, if you will, or something I'm proud of. When I see the success that somebody like Brad or Andy or Chris or Nando or Will or, you know, AJ or any Pierre guy, any of these people have had. Right. So, you know, that makes me feel good. Um, and so I think it's I think ultimately it can help. And, and finally, Matt, I think the most important reason I would I would suggest is that I think. Now, more than ever, our community is under fire. The fantasy football community is under fire, and that's a whole different podcast as to why and who's to blame and whether right. the criticisms are correct or not. And I don't want to get into that whole whole thing, but the fact of the matter is is that there's more negativity around the industry and the the um, the the pastime hobby of fantasy sports and specifically fantasy football than there ever has been before. And so I always joke that you know people ask me my job, and I said my job. In, I'm not until every man, woman, and child on the planet Earth plays fantasy sports. My job here is not done. So I, I always joke about that, but on some level, that's sort of true. And so the more people we can have out there spreading the gospel, the better it is. And so you should not be concerned about competition, you know. And I feel that people that, you know, to use your phrase, that sit in their ivory tower and don't retweet certain people or don't, you know, that don't help other people out. My guess is is that secretly they're insecure, and mm -hmm. they don't feel um, uh, they don't feel great about their own abilities, and they're worried that if they shine a spotlight on somebody else, that they might be overtaken. And I think that's that comes from a very small, insecure place. Um, you know, uh, we just hired here at ESPN. We just hired Mike Clay, yep. and I think Mike Clay is fantastic. And so I've been public about being excited about Mike Clay internally when i've been asked about um him like what do you think we're thinking about bringing him on I'm like yes please and like mike clay is great and i think um and i'm sure there's people out there that like mike more than me and you know you'd think like i'm not worried i'm happy you know what i mean like i think if, right if because i'm i'm pretty secure in who i am and i have there are people that like me and there are people that hate me and i don't think that's going to change because mike clay suddenly has a bigger audience 
I think Mike Clay deserves a bigger audience because his stuff is terrific. And so I'm always happy to, whether it's somebody like Mike or you, I've retweeted you a few times, you know, um, or or somebody like Sigmund or Evan Silver or anyone, you know, I'm always happy to, to say like, Hey, here's somebody who I think is to engage with that person and somebody that, to you know, elevate them, have my, on my podcast, what have you. Um, That's, you know, I I think that's important. Yeah. It's a very important thing to, to me too. Like, I mean, obviously you and I are on different levels of status in in terms of the industry, but I never want to get to the point personally where I'm protective of, you know, my, my, like not protective of myself, but like, yeah, like you mentioned insecure or not wanting to engage in people because they're quote unquote beneath me or whatever like that. I think that's silly. And I mean, that's what, that's what this podcast is all about, you know, helping elevate other people and bringing people to the top and everything like that. But so kind of closing out here, you know, we really appreciate your time and the story has been fantastic. I just kind of want to kind of want to give you the floor here in the last few minutes, just if there was, you know, cause like I said at the top, like we get the question all the time, you know, what can I do to get where you are or whatever? If, if there was one thing you would want to communicate to an aspiring writer that wants to get into the industry, what would that one thing be? Well, we already sort of touched on in terms of communication. I think communication is, here would be my general advice. Communication, I think, is very important. Probably the most important thing. Another thing I would say is in terms of having a variety of a skill set. Because it depends on what you want to do. And there's certainly people that can make a living just doing one thing or doing another. Um, uh, You know, but, uh, but generally speaking, you need to be good at a bunch of different things. You can be better at some things than other, but one of the reasons why I believe ESPN likes me and uh, is because in it. So I, the skill it takes to do a 140 character tweet, is different than the skill it takes to write a 1500 word or in my case, 5,000 word column, which is different than the skill set it takes to do a 45 minute podcast, which is different than the skill set it takes to do an eight minute radio hit, which is different than the skill set it takes to do a two hour TV show, which I do on, you know, fantasy football now on Sunday mornings, which is different than the skill set it takes to do a 45 second TV hit on sports center. When you've got 45 seconds to make a point about three players. Um, And so all those are different skill sets in terms of how you write, how you react, having somebody in your ear saying, wrap it up, throw it to Jay, whatever. Uh, And so you need to be, you can be better at some than others. You know, I I certainly think I'm a better writer than I am on TV, but I'm passable enough at, at, at all of it that, you know, ESPN likes me. I will tell you that I don't think I'm speaking out of school that when, when ESPN was talking to Mike Clay, for example, uh, when he came in, in addition to, you know, in addition to meeting with Pierre and meeting with some other people here digitally, and he met with me, um, he met with the radio people. He met with the TV people. He met with producers of Sports Center, producers of NFL Live, the people that do fantasy football now. Like he met with all facets of our company. And, you know, I don't know that he needed every single person to say, yes, we're in, but he needed a majority of them to say like, yeah, we right. like him. We think he'll work on our platform. If you if you guys bring him in, we will use him. You know. Yeah. So, um, you know, and so you know, it's a credit to Mike, obviously, that you know enough people were like, yeah, we're in. So I think that's important is is getting a wide variety of experiences, and I don't want to hear that you don't have that opportunity because it's easier than ever. It's some because it's easier than ever. It's sometimes hard to get noticed. But obviously, anyone can tweet. Anyone can start a blog. Anyone can start a podcast. Anyone can film themselves on their phone and upload a video to YouTube. Like, it's a weird thing. Like, just try this. Talk to your phone for a minute straight about a player. Mm. Yeah, I, I recently did one of those Periscope things, and it was it's a totally different, like, vibe than anything else I'd ever done. But people really seem to enjoy it and stuff like that. So, yeah. Sure, but it's a different skill set. And so you need to be today's fantasy analyst if you want to make a living at it. I believe for the most part needs to be skilled at a number of different ways of communicating. Yeah. Um, obviously you need to have strong analysis. You have to need analysis that resonates with readers, viewers, listeners, what have you. And it needs to be somewhat original. Um, I always prided myself, Matt, on the fact that if you took my name off of a column, 
and you took the three other, for the most part, fantasy columns, and you just put it out there, and you said, who wrote this column? If you read mine, even if you hate me, you're like, oh, that's a Matthew Berry column. Mm. And a lot of others, you're like, oh, I think it might be that guy, or no, it could be this guy, or it could be, you know, I feel like, and I still feel like this way, there's a there's a definite amount of sameness, especially if you like you take out the fonts and the pictures and the you know the web how the website looks. But if you just print it out on a piece of paper in the same font, would somebody be able to tell? Oh, that's a Matt Harmon article versus that's a you know somebody else article. I believe yeah, with a- me, again, love it or hate it, I believe you'd be able to say, oh, that's a that's a Barry article. So I always prided myself on that and tried to tried to focus on that. And the last piece of advice I would give, Matt, I think this is super important. And this goes back to something we also talked about a little bit, is being positive. Um, You don't want to promote other people. You don't have to promote other people. You know, it gets a little weird with ESPN because of some some of our policies, you know, and everything like that. But uh, but in general, what you don't want to do, you know, but there's no reason to be negative. One of the reasons I've talked about this on other podcasts, one of the reasons I block people on Twitter, I'm quick to block people on Twitter, especially other fantasy analysts, is because I want to know. So whatever you, whether you're a fan of me or not, I think you, I think I can say without sounding too braggy that I've had a pretty good career in fantasy. That I certainly that that I've done okay. That I've that um that I I've managed to again like I didn't know anyone. I answered a blind ad on the internet. And everything I've gotten, I've gotten, you know, myself in essence. It's not like there are certain people that are in our industry that were working at a company. I'm not going to say names. There is one person who is a prominent fantasy analyst um, who was working at a major media company in customer service. And they were starting their fantasy uh, department. And this guy was like, oh, I play fantasy. And it's just because that person happened to be in the doors. I'm like, okay, right. I'm your fantasy analyst. And I'm not saying anything bad about that person. And I think that person does a good job. Um, but my point is, is that, um, nothing like that happened to me. It's not like I was working at ESPN and I just raised my hand and they let me do fantasy. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was just like you, I was sitting at home. I was, you know, and I answered a blind ad on the internet and I've had a pretty good career and a pretty good run so far. And I've done it without being negative to anyone. I've never publicly like tweeted about like, Oh, Matt Harmon sucks. (laughs) Evan Silva got this wrong about such and such. Whatever. Cause we all make we all of us, you're trying to predict the future about something unpredictable. All of us will make bad calls, you know, and so or do this or do that. And so you'll never hear me publicly say something bad about anyone. And um, and so I think it's important. Um, so I guess I say that for two reasons. Number one, it is possible. It's very possible to have success in our industry without being negative towards anyone else in the industry, specifically anyone else in the industry, but just in general. Secondly, um, I think it's, it's one of those things where it's sort of a litmus test. So I get asked, um, not just ESPN, like where, you know, where ESPN said, Hey, we're thinking about Mike Clay. What do you think? But I'm, I'm lucky enough that I, most of the people that now are in the decision-making process at a number of major media companies, and there's also smaller websites. I'm, I've known Peter Shanky for 15 years, right? I've known Joe Bryan and David Dodds for 15 years. Like I, I've known pretty much everyone in the industry that could potentially hire somebody for a full-time job. I've known them for a long time. And a lot of times people will, if they're thinking about making a hire, I will get an email or a text from somebody saying, hey, we're thinking about this guy, what do you think? And one of the things I'll do if I don't uh, immediately know who they are, one of the things I'll do is I'll check them out on social media. And if I block them, I'm going to know, oh, that's interesting, because it's a bit of a litmus test. Right. It's, yeah. not that I have, it's not that I have thin skin. I do. But I. But, but the reason <laughs> is not because I have thin skin, Matt. It's because it's a litmus test. So when ESPN puts me on air, and this is a really important thing to understand, when ESPN puts me on air, when they put me on a microphone, whether it's on live radio or live TV on a sports center or, or Fantasy Football Now or Sunday NFL Countdown, they are trusting me with their brand. When they hire me, they are trusting me with my brand. So I could be – across the world in the middle of March, totally on vacation. It's 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning. I'm in a bar, but I get into a fight. The headline the next day, or I get arrested or whatever, ESPN's Matthew Barry, no. bar fight, blah, 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 whatever it is. 
So I represent ESPN, even if I'm like, well, come on, I was on vacation. I'm at a bar with my wife, whatever, you know. I represent ESPN at all times. Love it or hate it, that's the world we live in, right? And so um, so any company that is thinking about hiring you, whether it's whether it's a big company like ESPN, whether it's a quote-unquote mom-and-pop Rotowire football guys, but by the way, those guys are both do huge business and do really well, but whatever it is, Rotoworld, anything like that, they're trusting you with their brand, and they don't want to be out there. You know, even a smaller site that's trying to make a name for itself, like – you don't want to be known as that that site, yeah. um, you know, and uh, you don't want to hire somebody that could potentially hurt your brand. And if that person is dumb enough to like start cursing on Twitter or going after a troll or insulting, you know, somebody else in the industry, like, you know, I, I mean, I'll. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell a story. I, I told this at a speech recently that that um, uh, one guy, uh, it's, a long, it's a long story, but basically one guy that writes for a sm- site, like started trolling me just about like I had made a I had made a recommendation about a particular player. And uh, and this guy had a different take and he felt like his take was was more correct. And so he started trolling me, like calling me, calling me, not just saying like I disagree with your assessment, but more like. Hey, you schmuck. Hey, you, and a couple other names mm-hmm. were that. And, um, and so, uh, I engaged once, uh, and then I blocked him and moved on, but, and that's all I did. But I immediately got a DM from his boss who I'm friends with, who said, I'm so sorry. We've just fired that person. And I said, listen, I don't care. Do what you want. Certainly don't fire him on my behalf. Whatever. The guy's a troll. I don't care. I've just blocked him. And they wrote back to me and they said very smartly, no, we don't want him representing our site that way. We don't want to, um, that's not what what our site's about. But more importantly, and we ended up having a phone conversation about this, um, and he's very right about that. He's like, even if we weren't friends, like me and this guy are buddies. It's like, even if you and I weren't friends, like I don't need one of my guys taking a shot at ESPN because you know what? Maybe there's a day, there's a chance that ESPN uses our analysis one day. Right. Yeah. Hire us, or could you know, we have content deals with with Numberfire and RotoWire and Baseball Prospectus and FanGraph. I mean, we have you know, we do business with a lot of different websites, and so you know, some company is going to sit there and say like, why am we you know, anyway, this is a long story about, um, but I think that's like, I don't think how enough people appreciate the importance of sort of their public persona um, and what that message sends. And like the internet never forgets, man, the internet never forgets like a tweet or something you do on Facebook or whatever, you know, two years from now, you know, three years ago can come back to haunt you. Like, man, it's just, you know, I mean, it's not worth it. There have been writers that I've want like over a beer privately just don't do it yeah right yeah there have been writers that i've like take like taken interest in and then i've seen the way they've carried themselves and no matter how talented their work is i'm like immediately turned off and it can be it can be any different thing like yeah i mean i won't go into specifics but yeah there's there's a lot of stuff like that so i think that's actually really fantastic advice especially about the multi-platform thing because that's something that i'm personally trying to to get better in right now because i know like i feel confident that i know how to analyze players i feel confident in my writing ability but there are other things that will help you advance throughout your career that you need to be better at. So I think that's something that we haven't heard at this point in if through the podcast series or even just in general, I think that I forget about that. So I think it's super important. But um, Matthew, I really want to thank you for your time. This has been f- absolutely fantastic. Um, if you're not familiar with Matthew Berry, I don't know what rock you're living under. But of course, you can you can follow his, his stuff on ESPN, on television, and, and definitely check out his book as well. It's a good read. I've, I've read it before. It's it's a great story. And it expounds on more of the things that he that he's talked about here. So again, Matthew, I really well, want to We never got to the story of sort of how I got into ESPN. It does tell that story too. I think that might be of interest to... Uh, yeah, definitely. You know. Yeah, there's there's a lot more that we could have gotten into and could have gone on for hours and hours. But uh, I talk a lot. I, I'm a, oh, so, a long talker. But so do I. And I, that's something I'm having to learn through this podcast is like, all right, Harmon, you have to shut up and let the other – they have to let the guests talk. But see, that's what's great. So here, like I'll just use you as an example, and you probably can't say this, so I'll say this. 
and maybe I'm wrong on it, right? But like, you know, like, so I'll occasionally have, occasionally here at ESPN, we'll see NFL Network, right? And so right. maybe you're on and I'm not realizing, but you know, mostly when I see- I'm not on TV. <laughs> right. So it seems like mostly like in terms of NFL Network, it's, you know, it, it's Fabiano, it's Adam Rank, um, it's uh, Matt Money Smith sometimes, right? It's, you know, a couple other guys. Um, and so, which is great. And no, no disrespect to any of those guys. I'm friends with all those guys. Um, but my point is, so you're sitting here, you're, you're kind of the new guy. Um, and so you haven't gotten a shot at TV yet, but what you're doing is, is you're saying, like you just said, you did Periscope, you're doing this, uh, you're starting, you know, and maybe you're not part of the, the podcast rotation yet, but you're like, all right, how can I, Matt Harmon, improve my stuff? Yes, I have a job at NFL.com. Great. I'm getting paid. And yes, I can write an article. It'll be on a major website. Great. But what else can I do to prove to my bosses? Hey, and so here you're doing this podcast sort of off to the side. Um, not in competition with what you, your work for NFL.com is. You're doing career advice. Great. And you're also getting experience being on camera, whatever. It's a Google Hangout. Who cares? You're on camera. You're talking. You're interviewing somebody. And maybe you, you, know, you do enough of these and you feel like you're at a comfortable level where you can show one of these or whittle it down and show one of your bosses like, hey, here's what I've been doing. What do you think about a series for me on NFL.com where I interview so-and-so about this? You know, or Absolutely. can I get into the rotation? Or can I get into the, you know, on a podcast or on, on the radio to represent the site. And, you know, so I think that's super smart of you because I'm better on TV today than I was a year ago. I was better a year ago than I was two years ago. I'll be better three years from now. I don't think I'm perfect on any medium, frankly, but I'm better than I was before. It's just reps. You know, it's just yeah. about um, getting comfortable and, and, and getting reps. And so the more you can do, you, Matt Harmon, or, or anyone out there listening can, can do in terms of getting reps – I think is, you know, that's the, it's the Gladwell. It's 10, you know, 10,000 times. Right. So yeah, it's absolutely true. It, it definitely is. And I've, I've definitely learned a lot from this podcast today, and I think the audience will. So for those listening again, thank you. Always thank you for tuning in. Um, if you, if you haven't, uh, if you haven't reviewed the show on iTunes or subscribe, definitely do that. It's, it'll, it'll, it really helps the show. It helps us grow. And we're going to have a lot more here. And so again, I want to thank you all for listening today and I hope you learned something.